Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, we are thrilled here to, to host our good friend, advisor, Joe. Um, Joe from, uh, as commonly known as Joe, the CEO of Marketplace Pulse. Um, Marketplace Pulse um, has been uh, extremely important since the beginning of sales funding and, and sharing knowledge, expertise. Joe has uh, many, many years of, of, of expertise in this industry uh, and has shared and been an advisor of multiple companies in this space. So Joe, thanks for, for joining us, um, joining the sales funding team and, and our clients in this, this call. Thanks, if thanks you, for having me. Guys, if you have any questions, feel free to drop in the chat here and then we'll, we'll address those questions um, either during the conversation if it is relevant to the topic at hand or at the end. Great. Joe, you have a presentation to share with us? I do. Um, let me try this. Someone needs to give me the screen sharing access. Okay, one sec. You got it? I do. Give me one second. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Mm -hmm. um, so we, me and Ricardo wanted to have a quick chat on what we are seeing in e-commerce right now and how we think it's gonna look like in the next 12 months or so. I wanted to kind of kick off this, uh, this short discussion with what I think was um, the biggest lie of e-commerce for the last uh, 24 months is we all, we all saw this chart. Uh, I think this was the most famous chart in e-commerce and early on in the pandemic in 2020, we, we saw this massive explosion in e-commerce penetration and we all assumed e-commerce is going to have this five-year, 10-year step change. And every pitch deck of every company has used this chart since. Um, companies have used this chart to raise capital, to hire more employees, to build warehouses. They do a lot of great expansion um, because we all thought e-commerce is going to be so much bigger and it's all because of COVID. And what we thought was going to happen is that e-commerce is going to just keep expanding from, from that massive step we saw in early 2020. So e-commerce for the last 20 years was adding a couple percent points every quarter and then boosted up by over 5% in the single quarter 2020. We all thought it's just going to go back to the, the previous growth rate and just going to keep adding in, in, in penetration rates. It didn't, it didn't actually happen like that. What did actually happen is that um, e-commerce did reach this super high e-commerce penetration rate, but then every quarter since it's been dropping and dropping and dropping. And as, it, as we are approaching the end of 2022, e-commerce penetration is probably going to fall back to the trend line which basically means as far as e-commerce penetration is concerned, COVID actually didn't boost anything. And this, I think this chart has created a lot of confusion for us. And we, we seem to be going back and forward between has e-commerce been boosted by COVID? Uh, has it not? What does it mean for sellers? What does it mean for brands and how we should think about it in the future? So I think one of my kind of first takeaways is e-commerce penetration is really irrelevant to most businesses because e-commerce penetration measures the sort of digitization of, of a country or a market. So when we talk about e-commerce penetration rates, it's really relevant only to understand how are people behaving in retail as a whole. But if you are a business uh, who is transacting on, uh, and selling products or in any other way um, kind of playing a part in e-commerce, what you really care about is dollar spending. Uh, e-commerce penetration plays almost no part. And if you look at e-commerce penetration, if you look at e-commerce spending, 
it actually has been boosted by quite a lot and has not fallen back like e-commerce penetration has. And that's why I think it's so crucial to kind of change um, the sort of the charts we share or like the numbers we look at is that e-commerce penetration as a percent is almost relevant. What's really important to look at is e-commerce dollars being spent. And e-commerce dollars being spent right now in the US is almost a trillion dollars, which is a lot more than the run rate e-commerce was on just before COVID. So in 2020, the e-commerce run rate was roughly 700, $750 billion. And then over the next, over the next 24 months or, uh, or even less, it boosted up to a trillion. What that means is e-commerce is actually 25% bigger than the trend line would have, that would have predicted. So the dollars being spent uh, has increased by 25% compared to the trend line of e-commerce growth we have seen before COVID. So this is the boost we, we are actually seeing in e-commerce and we'll see how it actually plays out. But uh, looking at the sort of the, the, the uh, up and coming quarters and like the months to come, e-commerce e is really kind of slowing down in growth. And for the last couple of quarters, if you look at the results from Amazon, if you look at the results from Amazon, we kept seeing that they're reporting single digit growth, maybe even flat growth. Companies like eBay has reported negative growth. Um, so when we look at holiday shopping for this year, it looks like it's also gonna be somewhat flat. So if you look at Adobe Analytics, um, they put out a, a forecast for the holiday shopping from November to, to, to the end of December. And they're forecasting that this e-commerce is only gonna grow by 2.5%. So if you are growing any more than that, it basically means you are outper outperforming the market. And this is where I think we come to the, to the first question for Ricardo is, what are you seeing among like your sellers and what is the sort of growth uh, the sort of the growth stories you've seen so far, so far this year? Yeah, so we are witnessing a deceleration of sales since March. Uh, one curious aspect is that the first month that we saw negative numbers was September. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the speed of measuring the speed of sales. Compared to to last year, yes. Uh, the overall, the when you look in, on on an absolute basis, we are still seeing positive growth, and our sellers are outpacing the growth that we are seeing based on 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 public earnings records from Amazon, Shopify, and so on. When we when we see the the numbers of the overall marketplace growth. We are seeing our our clients still um, grow at least like one and a half to two times faster than the average market or the average. And how is the difference growth. between Amazon and Shopify? Like, are are Amazon sellers growing better or Shopify sellers growing better? So we don't. We actually see that it, it's rarely we see an Amazon seller that. Uh, reach a certain level that doesn't also sell like brands that were created mm -hmm. within the Amazon space that after a certain level, they have a presence outside of Amazon with Walmart and, and in omnichannel platforms. Usually sellers that sell in multiple platforms outpace the growth of sellers that are selling only on Amazon. Mm -hmm. But that data is, is, is kind of... Uh, it's not so, I would say, relevant because you're talking about companies that are well, better structured, that are mm -hmm. in a in a uh, more advanced stage in terms of of structure, growth, and brand recognition. Uh, I, I would say it's it's more about the at the stage that these companies are, and less about the platform they are selling. Uh, but Amazon still represents the majority of our our business. Um, and what we are also seeing is that an, an interest, uh, an increased interest in, in companies, foreign companies coming to the U.S. market. So this is something that we are witnessing. We have... Uh, uh, what countries uh, are we coming from? So we work with 
UK, continental Europe, Canada. We are now seeing some, some flow from Latin America, uh, countries that we're starting to, to work uh, and, and, and have some, some presence, local presence like, like Brazil, for example. Uh, and of course, Asia, China, but we, we, have, uh, we don't have a meaningful coverage there. So I would say mm -hmm. we are biased to, to, to say that our UK team is the fastest growing market for us this year. Not necessarily only the UK book, but the UK client base is the fastest growing client base for us. And is that in, in, in relative British to client base coming to sell into the US? Yes. Or they sell all over the place? They sell in the UK, continental Europe, and US. Okay. So, I mean, we, it looks like to kind of to put a wrap on this, it looks like, I mean, we are, we've been repeating omnichannel for the last 30 years, but it looks like it's, it's still a relevant thing is at a certain pace, at a certain stage of revenue to find growth opportunities, you can just stick to a single channel. You eventually go to more and more channels and you're, especially in this current complicated environment, you're ideally trying to, to see which of these channels are actually performing best. And it could be that depending on your category, depending on how you acquire customers, different channels are actually performing better than others. Yes. And I would say lately the UK and foreign countries or foreign sellers, they have benefit from the strength in the dollar, right? So they are mm -hmm. more competitive. Uh, they get more money for their buck. Okay. Uh, so now talking about the strength of the dollar, let's, let's talk about some of the issues we've been having in e-commerce as this, this growth keeps happening. So yeah. obviously e-commerce penetration, e-commerce dollar spending, it all increased a lot. And especially in early, like early 2020, for most of 21, we, did, we didn't really have a good idea of like what it actually means for us as sellers or even for the platforms as big as Amazon. It all, almost always led to companies overstocking all the retailers have too much inventory. That's why Amazon had the second prime day. It also led to overinvesting. So companies built, uh, companies deployed way too much capital into growth that didn't come. A good example of that is Shopify, which, hi which hired a lot of people, which then ended up having to let go a couple of months yeah. ago because the e-commerce didn't come. And then obviously overbuilding. Uh, Amazon built a lot of warehouses um, and then those warehouses were empty and Amazon ended up having to close their houses or try to get out of leasing. And so one of the kind of one of the charts uh, I've been looking at recently is this is this is coming from um, uh, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I guess the data is itself is pulled, is pulled by the Census Bureau. Um, this measures inventory to sales. So the, the higher the number is, uh, and it's, it peaks uh, now in 2022, the higher the number is, it actually, it, it means that companies have too much inventory in their, their houses. Uh, overstocking is a huge issue right now for retailers. I'm sure many of you here on this call as well, but, which ultimately is gonna lead to a lot of discounting in the, during the holiday season as retailers try to get rid of their inventory. So a great uh, I think case study of that is Peloton uh, indoor cycling bikes, again, thought COVID was a game changer for indoor, uh, indoor exercise, built a lot of bikes. No one ended up buying these bikes for the last couple of months and they had a massive discount now during Prime Day. I think it was 15% off, which was a huge de decrease in price from a $1,400 bike and actually sold a lot of bikes. But the reason why they had such a big discount is because of this massive issue, uh, issue of having too much inventory. And I think, that's probably true for most of the sellers here. And that's something to keep in mind as kind of, as we keep, keep flipping back between overstocking and understocking is, is, is these sort of charts. But um, a lot of the costs were actually causing this um, overstocking. And one of the biggest costs of that, one of the biggest causes of that is container prices. So this is, a, this is a, it's called a Baltic index. So it measures um, both US and European imports. And that's why it's pegged at uh, $10,000. The actual cost to import from China to the US reached uh, as much as $20,000 in November. And we all thought that's, that's, that's it. Like these container prices are never gonna decrease. We all, 
uh, we're all going to be paying 10 times the price than the prices we used to pay before the pandemic. Um, so the, it was everything was costing 10 times more. Everything was taking much longer. The containers were getting stuck in uh, waiting for to get offloaded off ships. And then over the next couple of months, all of this changed again. So in November of last year, container prices were at all time highs. By now today, importing containers to the, uh, to the US is already at almost 2019 prices, which basically means all the COVID increase is almost completely evaporated. And a huge reason for that is that demand is very low. As I was showing just a couple of slides before, inventories are very, very high, which basically means no one is importing anything anymore because no one is importing anything anymore. And because of the, uh, the traffic jams of container ships are gone, container prices are resetting. So if you're ordering things right now, you'll be you're paying norm, kind of normal prices and it's unlikely that it's going to peak again because there, there shouldn't be any reason for that and related to that and some kind of something that ricardo brought up currencies has been playing a big factor for this so if you look at um uh, chinese yuan prices to compared to us dollar um the us dollar has never been this strong and i think it's it's the strongest it's been for over 10 years uh, so if if, if you are if we find ourselves that you're actually paying your manufacturers in US dollars, all of a sudden you could be buying 20% more than you could just a couple of months ago. So we'll have to wait and see how kind of Chinese economy plays a part in this and how US dollar to other currencies play a part in this. But we're seeing this massive shifts in the market with container prices, currency rates. And since everything in retail ultimately gets it has to be imported and often from foreign places, all of these things is, I think, a huge thing to keep in mind that uh, kind of inventory levels, currency levels, um, and, and the sort of the management of supply chain. So again, back to Ricardo is like, what sort of challenges uh, are, are, are sellers having with their, with their cash flows and how, uh, how best you're seeing them actually solve it? I can, I can start talking about our cash flow. Because go ahead, go ahead. Uh, it's uh, it's interesting because Salus is we we found the company six years ago and usually our models they rely on on seasonality and seasonality is built based on on the data that we were able to to collect throughout those years. Like this year, our seasonality model is worthless because. Our clients were not buying based on supply and demand. They were mm -hmm. buying goods because they were buying any goods based on the availability of those goods for them to purchase. At the beginning of the year, there was this rush to 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 talk to to negotiate with manufacturers and secure as much inventory as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that that's a factor of of expected a continue increase in sales, but also the disruption in, uh, in the supply chain. So yes, things are back to normal. And you, as you can see, based on your graph, you are, most of our clients are still overstocked. So, so you, you have provided them with capital to buy that inventory and now it's overstocked. That's what great. Are doing? Yes. What are we doing? So now that that inventory is, is, is going down, but in a much slower pace than predicted. So margins are being, un margins are under pressure because storage fees are, are higher than usual. Uh, sales velocity are down, is down across the board. And you need to then compete on pricing and and on top of that, you have inflation. So, you know, if you if you if you have employees, you need to rethink about you know the pay, the, the, the readjust their salaries and so on. There is a lot of pressures across the, the the chain. So, in 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 hindsight, we are looking at applications now uh, in a more in a more conservative way because we are seeing. A, a very relevant 
pressure on margins, on profit so what, margins. What, what's your advice for someone who has bought too much? Now have, they have a warehouse with three months, six months worth of supply. What yeah. do they do? I, I think it's, um, it's going to be a, a competition on pricing. Be strategic on how you advertise and position your, your products to to have uh, a chance to, to sell and, and unload those, uh, those products that you got stuck. Uh, and, and especially look at your, your best sellers and focus on your best sellers to, to kind of recycle your capital. That's the best way to do it. And um, there's, no, there's no secret, right? So we, 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 we saw a lot of companies focus on growth knowing that, that that continuous virtual cycle of, you know, I'm going to sell more, even though I have low margins, I'm going to sell more and I'm going to eventually be able to have a cushion. This is, no, this is not, this environment, we're going to see like flat to low growth sales. We're going to see pressure on margins. So you need to focus on your, on the products that you have better margins and be more aggressive and, and and position better those products and kill so how, the, the, the worst performing product. So then how are the default rates for the capital you provide compared today to a year ago? Um, are I'll you seeing you, more sellers struggling to pay back the loans? We, we saw uh, a number of, of clients reaching out. Um, thankfully, we we are probably one of the few providers that offer some flexibility in terms of, of, of you know, uh, we offer up to six months interest only period. So when you, you have, you have a, a, a wider window mm -hmm. to purchase your goods and start selling. So that's one thing. We are, we are going, we are offering term loans up to two years. So the monthly, capital committed is smaller compared to the overall uh, picture. But even with that, not talking specifically about seller's funding, we, we saw a marginal increase. I think that we have a, a, a relationship with our clients that rely on us, not only for working capital, but they know that we are um, a partner for the good times and, and the bad times. But we are seeing across the industry changes in the way customers, our, our competitors are positioned themselves. We saw massive layoffs uh, from some of our direct and indirect competitors. I think the industry overall, the fintech industry and lending industry overall is suffering more uh, than, than expected. And especially those who lack a uh, robust underwriting model or lack a robust relationship with their customers will suffer more. Okay, so it's, I mean, it sounds like you're doing great. Um, yeah, I can't complain. Good, good. But I mean, it does, it does sound like, <laughs> like the cash flows of sellers is more difficult to manage right now. And it yeah. is so much more important to be really well aware of kind of supply chain forecasting lead times, the prices you're paying, how much inventory you have left, whatever inventory turns. So like the sort of the sort of the financial analysis of the business is perhaps much more important because the the growth is not as free as it was before. Correct. And um, and, and also be more aware of the competitive landscape. Absolutely. absolutely. Like on, your, your pricing power is more important now than ever. And so still going through what has happened uh, over the last kind of couple of years is obviously fulfillment costs are up a lot. And this is especially applicable to Amazon sellers as well as anyone who's using any sort of a 3PL or any sort of fulfillment provider. Across the board, they have all increased um, fulfillment costs, uh, which include obviously pick and pack costs, delivery costs, storage costs. And if you look at, um, in this case, Amazon's fees, uh, FBA fees, um, Amazon has introduced fee increases almost every year and they always were somewhat kind of small um, 
But then over the last um, year, we actually introduced three, uh, three separate price increases for all, for all sorts of different reasons. And thus, if you compare prices, you're gonna be paying now as well as in the next 12 months as and to prices two years ago, the actual price increases, price increases are actually massive up to 30% or more. And it doesn't look like these, these fees are, are decreasing. Um, so, I mean, Ricardo, like, have you seen any sort of change in how sellers store the inventory or like where they put the inventory? Are you seeing more sellers send less inventory to FBA in a way to avoid a lot of these fees? Yeah, uh, we are seeing our probably like our biggest accounts now are using Amazon and other 3PL providers to to store their goods, and they they it's it's being a more dynamic approach to to that. Mm -hmm. And they they were not doing that before COVID. No, I, I'll say it was like a very convenient like ship to Amazon because uh, the mm -hmm. sales, you know, products were, were going out of the shelf so fast that it was very convenient and efficient to do that. But now I would say, you know, given the level of inventory that we are witnessing and also the price difference between Amazon and some independent providers, clients are more mindful of, of the that price difference and the, they have a more like I said, then dynamic approach to that. Okay. Um, obviously, ad advertising costs has been, has been an issue for yeah. anyone, everyone involved in this space. Amazon has been adding more and more ad space to their site, as well as as more sellers started buying ads. Advertising prices continue to increase over time. I mean, if you if you go to the search page on Amazon, most of the things you see are are ads. Um, and also on the DTC space, um, Facebook and Apple, uh, sort of Facebook, uh, Facebook advertising has been less efficient and more expensive because of Apple, because of Apple changes. The same sort of changes are coming to uh, Google phones as well. And these things, they're, they're never getting back to normal. The sort of the advertising complexity and price is continuously gonna evolve, but basically it means that there's a huge pressure on sellers to keep innovating and finding both new ways to acquire consumers, but this specifically to, uh, as it relates to the direct-to-consumer brands, and then also for the Amazon sellers to kind of keep finding tools and reporting and, and kind of systems to, 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 to better spend the sort of advertising spend they have available because as, as Amazon introduces more ad types um, and more places to advertise and more ways to advertise, the sort of the complexity required to manage all of that is, is is ever increasing but uh we have talked about all these all these negative things and all the sort of the lack of growth the complexities of inventory importing the increasing costs um but then now i think it's a good time to talk about the good things and most of the good mo many of the good things is that like most things are not changing so e-commerce in the west um, has been very very stable for a very long time and obviously COVID it changed some things around, but most of, most of the things are still exactly the same. Uh, so for example, Amazon is still 40, 45, 50% of US e-commerce, depending on how you measure it. And that's not changing at all. Um, it, it looks like Amazon continues to grow at, at, sort of at the rate US e-commerce is growing, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. But basically as an as a, as a Amazon seller that basically means that you are you're still in, in in the biggest marketplace there is and and as as much as Walmart has grown and they have grown a lot as much as marketplaces like Target have grown the sort of the leaderboard of US e-commerce has not changed for the last 10 years or so and it looks like it's not going to materially change uh, anytime soon so that's that's good it it, it provides a certain uh, a certain level of stability um, and Shopify is still the default for a lot of the direct-to-consumer brands. Um, it, there's obviously a lot of alternatives from, from big commerce, which might be perhaps more applicable to enterprise clients, but there's obviously big commerce, WooCommerce, and a million other ways to make uh, e-commerce websites, but Shopify is still the default. So 
these things are not changing. This, this, the, the sort of the platforms in this space are very well known, and you don't have to kind of keep reinventing the wheel. We we know the places where you, you could be or should be selling, and these things are probably going to materially evolve. You're not seeing massive disruption to this model, but I think this is perhaps kind of more fun things to talk about and kind of and think about is we have been talking a lot about social commerce. Um, and the social commerce has been the promise given, um, given to us as a way to really disrupt the e-commerce landscape and also change how we shop. And the reason why social commerce has been so promising to us is that um, most analysts, the most reporting has looked at China where social commerce is so much bigger and so much prevalent and assumed that the same will happen in the US. And we've been waiting uh, and we've been looking at Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat and even Pinterest. And we've been waiting for these platforms to build out social commerce functionality. In, in essence, allowing us to find, discover products on these platforms and transact directly in the app. Uh, relating to that is obviously live commerce as well, in, involving live video. Um, these things this year took a massive took, took a massive stop and kind of TikTok has paused their plans to do live commerce. Facebook has paused their plans to do live commerce, and now there's been some great reporting. Uh, a screenshot of, of one of them is uh, kind of on your screen. Is that I mean, Facebook has really given up a lot of their social commerce uh, initiatives instead falling back to just focusing on advertising. So kind of, the lesson we're seeing right from here, from this is that we do talk a lot about social commerce, interactive commerce, live commerce, but we always just fall back to doing advertising on these social platforms. So there's quite a, there's quite a difference between using Facebook as an advertising channel for e-commerce or using Facebook as an e-commerce channel itself. And it looks like this year, because of pressure on these companies from the financial markets to be more profitable, they've given up a lot of experiments and all of these experiments are these social experiments. So it looks like that delayed the sort of advancement and or the, the, the growth of social commerce in the in the West by quite a few, quite a few years, unfortunately. So this this ultimately brings to to um, to the outlook for the for the year to come, and I'm and, and I'm first uh, going to show my take, and then I'm going to and then I'm, uh, then I'm going to ask Ricardo what he thinks is uh, what is what is it what is his outlook. I'm going to uh, I'm going to first start I think by this uh, very fascinating statistic I saw I saw recently is um, when I first mentioned that e-commerce penetration is perhaps not the key metric to follow and ultimately e-commerce dollars are so much more important. There's been a lot of talk in the industry about what is really e-commerce and how big it really is. And through a lot of surveys and other analysis, this specifically, the chart on your screen specifically is from Forrester. They've been thinking about how much of a sales are actually digitally influenced as opposed to just transacted online. And what they found is that today, roughly 60% 60 of sales are actually influenced digitally. So they, it, it means they, they either were transacted online, you bought something on Amazon, or you found a product online and then you bought it in physical stores, or you, you went to a store and you, you, you were scanning products using an app in, inside of a store. All this means that digital influence sales is already 60% of US commerce. Uh, but the way we transact is not always digital. And that's, I think, is hugely important. And the lesson, I think the kind of the most important lesson to, from this is that it's not just that people transact sometimes online. It's also that they can discover your products online, but then buy them in physical stores or buy them in your own physical stores. And the way you, you, you can build presence for your products in, in, the, in, the, real, in, the, in the real world, sort of the brick and mortar stores, um, that's I think important to look at. So kind of my, my outlook uh, for the year is that obviously importing from China is back to normal. I mean, it's, it's both fast and available and now almost as cheap as it could be. We'll see if, if kind of 
the next couple of quarters is going to introduce some new headwinds, but it looks like it's going to be fine. Uh, advertising is less effective on Facebook, and that's not going to change. Um, I mean, we've been talking about kind of Apple changes, the iOS uh, 14 uh, changes for a long time. Now it's just time, it's just a time to move on. We have to innovate and find ways to acquire consumers, and these changes are not, are not going to get rolled back. If anything, they're all going to get more extreme which means the effectiveness of these advertising platforms can perpetually decrease as prices uh, only increase. Um, social live commerce is still tiny. So these platforms are super relevant for uh, advertising as well as people discovering products. And then, as I was saying, perhaps buying your products in physical stores, but the, the dream that Facebook or t Instagram or TikTok will meaningfully challenge Amazon as an e-commerce platform that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, data and tools keep getting better, so I think this is this is super good for anyone who's who's reached a certain scale. Is that the sort of data you can extract from all these platforms, as well as the sort of tools available to manage these platforms, integrate data, share things around, build reporting, build analysis, use it for supply chain management, but use it for advertising management. All these things continue to get better. And I think um, many of the challenges of this year relating to supply chain are now solved through all sorts of data tools. And these are the sort of things I think are continuously important to invest into. Um, having said that, I think e-commerce uh, commerce operations in general are keep getting more and more complex. As Ricardo was, was saying, like all their clients at a certain scale, they all sell in multiple channels. Selling on multiple channels typically means you're also using different warehousing solutions. Sometimes that means integrating with, I don't know, half a dozen or a dozen um, SaaS tools to manage all that thing. It means uh, dealing with fi like financing, it means dealing with payments, it means dealing with all sorts of different things. So I think not only is kind of advertising getting more complex, everything around e-commerce is getting more complex. And there are tools and services and people ultimately that help you, but uh, e-commerce is not going to get simpler anytime soon. Uh, if at a certain at a certain scale you're selling in many different channels, at a certain point you're probably managing retail stores. N none of that complexity is going going uh, gonna, uh, go going away, and if if anything, it's only going to increase. Um, year over year, I think growth in next year is going to start health is going to start looking healthy again. So we'll probably finish Q3 and Q4. The flat or weak or even negative growth for some, but I think starting next year, because next year is going to be compared to 2020, you will start seeing good, good, strong numbers from the platforms themselves as well as individual sellers. And there's a lot of uncertainty left. Uh, there's where there are questions with in, uh, um, inflation, there are questions with the potential recession, which which in some ways has already happened, but could also happen in a much more severe way. It's obviously going to affect what people shop and what, how people buy and what people buy. If you're selling necessities, there's going to be a lot of demand. If you're selling high-priced items in, in, in luxury, there's probably going to be less demand. Um, this is all going to unravel in, in, in time to come. Uh, but ultimately, I'm kind of my finishing thought is that like e-commerce penetration looks stuck, uh, and it's stuck because it, it's measuring against total retail spending, and that total retail spending is is massive. And the, the thing is, people are spending a lot of their money on goods, and they continue to, and they will continue to next year. Uh, but the much more important thing is that everything we buy is now influenced by digital, and the things we we, we purchase in a Walmart store are still influenced by a thing you see, a, a show you see on Netflix. And I think the way the sort of the novel brands and the interesting brands are thinking about how they, their products are getting discovered, who discovers them and, and why these things happen now in very unique ways. And the sort of, it's not as simple as buy Google ads, drive into their website and convert consumers. There's so many more creative ways to think about it. And the most important thing to, to, to realize is that e-commerce penetration is not 15% or 20%. It is 60% when you consider that all the, all these sales are influenced by digital. Ricardo, what are you saying? 
so I'm thinking about this and I, I, I read in an article not, not long ago, and I don't know if you ever measured that, but overall retail sales include oil and gas prices, uh, oil and gas sales. Yes. So, of course, in well, the year when, when you see, yes, yes but, but in the U.S., uh, if if you if you look in a year where gas prices went to the roof, of course that penetration will also the percentage of of online sales as as total retail sales will be impacted by that because the denominator is being, mm -hmm. you know, inflated by an increase in, in, in energy prices. But apart from that, uh, I completely agree with you. I, I, I believe that uh, our industry has witnessed, uh, you know, it was positive impact by, by the pandemic. And we were probably expecting those numbers to materialize in five years and, and they happen in two years. But that shift is structural. It's not a short-term thing. I think that consumer behavior changed and we are all here witnessing this and we continue to witness this. Uh, you look at uh, the previous chart that you saw like yesterday, today, and, and uh, it's, it's like double mm -hmm. in size, right? More than double in size. So, I mean, I, I'm... I'm an optimistic. Uh, I continue to, to believe that, that we as a business will, will continue to be positioned as, you know, an e-commerce player more than a financial player because our focus is and will be, will continue to be in e-commerce because of all um, the things that you said. And I, and I honestly believe that the soft sales consumer behavior, like we are, I, I believe that we are in a recession. I'm already seeing like energy prices going down. If you go to the, to fill up the tank here, you're already saving some, some bucks. Uh, so I think inflation will, will be uh, under control and will be mainly driven by this soft demand that we're going to see and, and, and mainly driven by consumer behavior. So, But I mean, if, you, if, you're a, if you're a brand and you sell online, what you, should be pay, what you should be thinking about right now? Your product mix, the sector that you, the, the industry, the segment that you're in. Um, again, I, I'm focusing on, on margins focusing on, on products that are, are winners and, and, and kind of um, prioritize those over, over volume. I would, I would focus more on profitability and less on volume of sales. Have you, are, you, are you seeing a lot of your, your clients, for example, from the US successfully sell internationally? There is. I would say the, 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 the reverse is a more meaningful trend, like foreign sellers selling into the US, which means increased competition for US sellers selling domestically. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the year, there was, uh, I saw some charts and studies showing the size of US commerce um, and the expected growth of US commerce. And one thing caught my attention, uh, the top 10 fastest growing markets, the US was the only developed market in that list. Mm -hmm. And the delta of, of commerce growth in the US represented more, just the delta represented more than the overall commerce market, e-commerce market in all the other nine emerging markets value there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why yes. this is a natural flow. We're going to continue to see international comp competitors coming to the West to compete with, with you here. And that's why you need to be 
mindful that there will be increased competition. The dollar is stronger. That benefits all these foreign uh, foreign sellers to, to come into the US. And uh, but there is the flip side of that. If you are importing your products, you're paying less, and that's going to be a relief for now. So if you're if you're an Amazon seller and your your revenue is let's say five million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And 100% of that comes from Amazon. Where do you sell next? Um, nowadays, I would probably, depending on the segment, but I would probably find ways to, to diversify internationally. I mean, mm -hmm. look at Canada is so easy to, to go. Uh, you, you will rely on logistics and, and, and probably the same team will, will support you to go there. Uh, I think Europe now, continental is, Europe specifically is a tough place, is in a tough place in terms of economic growth. UK will perform better than continental Europe. Do you uh, open a Shopify store? If you have already a, a, a brand, it's tough to build a brand. Yes. It, it, it's really tough. I, I honestly admire so many clients of ours who, who were able to succeed in building that brand and reaching out of the, the Amazon space. Uh, because that's where you, you can create some goodwill for, for your company. And the market for, for M&A is, is probably, I wouldn't say close, but... Uh, less active than it used to be, but this will, will come back. We'll see a turnaround on, on that too. But yeah, I would go, I would start looking at maybe some international expansion. And if you, if you have a chance to, to build a brand and, and, and have the budget to spend on advertisement to, to build that brand, Shopify, I'm going to say e-commerce because we have a partnership with e-commerce. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll do that. But, uh, so I guess last question is, do, if we were to have this conversation 12 months from now, at the end of 23, mm -hmm. do you think it's going to be a lot more positive or similar to this year? No, I, I think that we'll be out of the woods already. I think this down, downturn or all the, the negative the negativity that we are seeing now will, will be over in the next six months. Okay. So, I mean, your, so your, your message, things are gonna get better very, very quickly and we'll, we can come back to building. Yeah. And uh, I always say polit politicians, they need something to fix, so. <laughs> <laughs> we are and we all need something to do we yeah all need something right to do. so yeah i think we will be in a better position definitely than we are today awesome that's that's much more positive than most of the things i talked about so yeah uh, i guess thanks thanks for your time and i think we probably used up most of our a lot of time and i'm sure we'll talk soon all right any questions uh do we have any questions um uh, no no open questions. Oh, there is one. Do you really see brands going more omnichannel, mainly Walmart? Or is Amazon the dominant player as ever? Uh, dominant as ever? I, I have, I think, my own take, and you probably have your own, yours. I think um, what is called a brand is 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 a spectrum so most of successful sellers on amazon are not brands yet they're successful on amazon can you take that success and transport it to other marketplaces not always but it's possible can you take that and 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 kind of expand it into an actual kind of self-sustained organic um direct to consumer brand Ideally, yes. I think it probably happens in one out of a thousand sellers, one of, out of 10,000 sellers. Um, but in reverse, 
if you're a successful seller already on Shopify and, and can and, and running your own direct to consumer business, can you take that product and 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 successfully sell on Amazon and Walmart? Absolutely. So I think what is a brand and how transfer and trans transferable the brand is is a spectrum. Ultimately, I think what I'm I mean what I keep seeing all the time is that I mean you could be you could you could build a massive business on Amazon and not be able to actually take it beyond Amazon. And yet that's not a problem because the Amazon business is so massive. Yeah. Amazon is still is still the biggest. And so like you couldn't build a business just on selling on Walmart. Uh, but you can build a business on Amazon and then sell on other platforms. You mm -hmm. can build a business on direct to consumer and then sell on other platforms. But if the smaller marketplaces like I know Walmart or Target and the like, they're not big enough to self to kind of contain a business. I agree. What are you seeing among your clients? Like, I, like I no, no, yeah, it's well, really well put, I, and I, I think that. I haven't seen a company yet that may, makes me think, okay, that's the challenger. That's the company that will challenge Amazon. I haven't seen that yet. So, okay, Joe, uh, I think we have no, no more questions. I'd like to thank you again for joining us. Uh, feel free to, uh, to, uh, reach out to us with any additional questions. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in our next webinar. Thank you all. Thank you.